past week, we have been analyzing the edicts of the Seventh-day Adventists. We're going to continue that at uh, this time. We're doing so because most of their edicts are germane to uh, all uh, Christians. Um, all but two or three are uh, germane to all Protestant Christians, and all but four or five are germane to all Christians, including the Orthodox variety of Roman Catholics, uh, Greek Orthodox, uh, Copt, and Russian Orthodox, to name a few. Although, as I understand it now, the Georgian Orthodox uh, Church is uh, probably the most uh, well-accepted uh, wholly uh, false, mind you, but the uh, in the Georgian Republic, the people are about 90% in favor of uh, of their orthodox version of uh, Christianity. It uh, doesn't bode well for them. We are uh, about 12, uh, in fact, exactly 12 edicts into the um, Seventh-day Adventist uh, nomenclature. Uh, they were chosen for this because of a caller uh, who said, you know, you don't uh, speak about them. They are um, 20 million strong, which means they are, are actually much more prolific than our Mormons by uh, more than two to one, perhaps even three to one more prolific than our uh, Mormons. The other thing that's unique about them is that they are also the uh, but publish more than does any other denomination, and by a huge margin. They are just absolutely devoted to uh, Ellen White as a prophetess. Uh, now, she is a looney tune, um, akin to uh, to Muhammad kind of looney tune with her, with the, the revelation she had. Now, she is very dead at, uh, at this moment, but... Uh, Everything that she extrapolated based upon her personal revelations uh, goes from being untrue to absurd. So it does serve as an interesting foil. We were on church um, in our program yesterday. I began by uh, sharing with you that church is a uh, has no basis even in the Greek of the Christian New Testament. No basis whatsoever. Not even a word remotely akin to uh, to church to be found there. Even in the Greek. The Greek word that uh, has been replaced with church is ecclesia, which means called out. Uh, and it is a, a fairly weak, uh, fairly inept translation of the robust Hebrew term kara uh, and mikra, which are invitations to be called out and to meet with God. Uh, Kara also conveys the idea of reading and reciting Yah's testimony. The church is a transliteration of a Teutonic sun goddess. The uh, daughter of Helios was Church. Uh, it is from the name of this sun goddess that we get the English word circus and circle. Uh, so you can rest assured that, you, that if you are a Christian, your religion has lied to you about the idea that there is a church, that God has such a thing, that God is involved with the church. God is not even remotely involved with the church. He did not establish a church. He does not have a church. He has never been into a church and would never go into a church. They are right when they write that the church is a community of believers. That's the problem with religions. They are communities of believers, of faithful. They are not communities of people who know or understand. In fact, knowledge and understanding would destroy the community. Uh, they say here, confess Jesus Christ as Lord. We covered that yesterday. There is no Jesus. Uh, no one even remotely akin to that name. That is not the name that Yahweh ascribed to his set-apart corporeal manifestation. That was Yahusha, which means Yahweh saves. Christ is not a last name. Uh, it isn't even an, a, a reasonable translation of the a Hebrew title, and because it is a Hebrew title, it should never be transliterated, which means to replicate the sound of a Greek uh, replacement in English. So there is no basis for either. Uh, you will find neither in any one of the 69 extant uh, manuscripts, uh, codexes they are called, uh, typically comprised of either um, books of papyrus sleeves or uh, papyrus fragments of the so-called Christian New Testament that have been uh, found dating prior to Constantine. So of those 69, on you will not find even a Greek variation of uh, Jesus or Christ written out on a single page of any of them.
So to say that it's a transliteration of the Greek is, uh, in the case of Jesus, that would also be untrue. Uh, and it can't be a transliteration of the Greek for Christos because uh, it's never written out. So it's a, it's a complete web of lies by Christians who claim, of course, that their Bible is the unerrant word of God, and they can't get the title right, they can't get the name right, and they have absolutely no basis of credibility with regard to either. And as it relates to Lord, Lord is Satan's title, according to Yahweh. If you are praying to a Lord, you're praying to the wrong spirit. And once you know what Yahusha's actual name is, you know that Yahweh is our Savior. That's what Yahusha means. Yahweh saves. As we considered yesterday, they wrote then that in a community in continuity with people of God in the Old Testament times. Well, that's uh, not true either. There is no continuity between the church and the covenant. None. And uh, the, uh, there is no such thing as an Old Testament much less a New Testament. There's only one Testament. It's comprised of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. That was, by the way, Yosha's testimony as well, that there is that the Word of God is comprised of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. Now, we are not called out of the world. We are called uh, out of human institutions, away from our country, away from religion, away from politics, away from patriotism. Now, they, then they say that uh, we join together for worship. God does not want to be worshipped. If God wanted to be worshipped, he would not be worthy of it. Only insecure people, uh, individuals, want to be worshipped. A secure individual wants to have a caring, mutually beneficial relationship. Fathers, for example, want uh, their children to enjoy all that life has to offer. They never want their children to worship them. So the concept of worship is uh, is appropriate for lords, but it's not appropriate for our Heavenly Father. They claim then it's uh, the church exists for instruction in the word, but if you were instructed in the word, you would know that there's no such thing as a church. For the celebration of the Lord's Supper, they write next. That's where we were when the program came to a, a close, at least the second hour yesterday. If you're dealing with the Lord's Supper, you have been completely beguiled. You have been fooled by the religion and led astray. Yosha was not celebrating a Last Supper or a Lord's Supper. He was explicit. He was celebrating and observing Pesach. He was Torah observant. If you're going to follow his example, if you're going to benefit from him, you too need to observe and celebrate Pesach. And it was in the observation and celebration of the Pesach meal that he referred to the bread and the wine as representing what he himself was going to do on our behalf as the Passover lamb. If you do not understand the role of the unleavened bread as a, as a part of the celebration of Pesach, which includes matzah, then you are not saved. And if you do not understand the role of the Passover lamb on Passover relative to life, then you remain mortal and are going to die. That's the truth. If you're unable to recognize that there was no Last Supper, therefore there's no Eucharist, there is no communion, and that what... Yahushua was encouraging us to do is to recognize his role in the fulfillment of the first three mikre, Pesach, Matzah, and Bekorim. Then you have no relationship with God. You don't know him. He does not know you. You are not part of his family. You are not saved. This is serious stuff. They uh, write that The purpose of the church is for the worldwide proclamation of the gospel. As I shared with you, there is no term even remotely akin to gospel either, found uh, even in the Christian New Testament. Euangelion is the uh, the word in Greek, although Yahushua never spoke Greek. Uh, he, uh, He spoke Hebrew. He also spoke Aramaic, which is a cognate of Hebrew. Uh, He never once spoke Greek. He never said Euangelion. But translation of what he said in Hebrew into Greek, euangelion, does not mean gospel. 
Gospel is a compound of, uh, of two old English words. It's from got and spell. It is therefore the spell or the miraculous uh, uh, sorceristic um, uh, performance that has been cast upon uh, an individual by an occultic figure of God, which was the name for the Teutonic sun god. Evangelion means you means uh, beneficial, helpful, healing, uh, because those things are positive, uh, also by extrapolation good. And uh, angelion, which is uh, uh, message, but most most literally messenger. So it's a beneficial messenger is what euangelion would say. And, and since they, a helpful and healing, beneficial messenger brings a message that would be uh, similar, it can be extrapolated to beneficial message, even though its primary meaning is beneficial messenger. And so since it's... Uh, uh, not being transliterated into English. There, you don't read euangelion in your English translation. Uh, and uh, you don't read a translation of it, which would be uh, beneficial messenger. This term, just like uh, the replacement of ecclesia, which means called out with church, is another substitution. I'm not even sure it's a copy edit. It's a wholesale change, a replacement. Rather than being the inerrant word of God, what we now have is the deliberately errant word of men. So if you think that there are Gospels and that Christianity is based upon the Gospel of grace, you would be entirely wrong. They go on to say that their church derives its authority from Christ. Christ doesn't have a church, never spoke of a church, never mentioned anything remotely akin to a church has no association with pagan goddesses. Yausha draws uh, our attention to and provides the authority to fulfill the promises of the Mikre, the very thing that Ecclesia was designed to communicate, which are the invitations to meet with God, of which there are seven. <laughs> These uh, folks, the uh, Seventh Day Adventists, uh, can't get out of their uh, the way of their own lies. Uh, it is uh, it's a terrible web that one uh, creates when you begin uh, proclaiming that which isn't true. And this is serious business. You know, you might somebody might say, "Well, you're sure mean to to be uh, attacking people's faith in this way." That's not nice. Well, actually, there's nothing I could do that would be nicer, because it, when you know for certain, and I know for absolutely certain that Christians who believe any of this are wrong and that therefore they're squandering their souls because, and I know that they're wrong because I know what Yahweh said and what Yahweh said, and he happens to be God, contradicts everything that they say. And as a result of that, I know for certain that this, uh, this Christian denomination is lying to its 20 million adherents. And as such, the single most compassionate and caring thing I can do is to expose these lies. Now, their next statement is that the church is God's family. No, it's not. The covenant is Yahweh's family. He makes that point emphatically clear. That's why we've been studying the covenant for months now in the third hour of Shattering Mists. God has but one family. It's the covenant. He has but one covenant. And the entire purpose of God creating the universe is for the covenant. And so to suggest that God's family is, uh, is a pagan concept that he never once spoke of is, uh, is utterly absurd. And it's wrong when God says, I have but one covenant. 
And in fact, in the, the statement we read yesterday, it even began it, this one and only covenant of mine. And it's, uh, he says, adopted by him as uh, children. So the church is God's family, adopted by him as children. I, I don't, don't even know what that means. But uh, the, to even get to the covenant, it's we who are adopted into the covenant. It's not the covenant which is adopted. I mean, this is suggesting that the church, which is a replacement for the covenant, covenant is adopted by God. It's, it's not. It's we're adopted into the covenant as his children. They even got that part wrong. And then it says its members live on the basis of the new covenant. But there is no new covenant. There's not a single reference anywhere in the totality of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms to a new covenant. Not one. There is but one covenant. That one covenant we are told in Yirmiyah, upon Yahweh's return, will be reaffirmed. It will be renewed. It will be restored with not a church, not with Gentiles, not with believers, not with the faithful, but instead with Yahuda, which means those who are related to Yah, and Yisrael, which is individuals who engage and endure with God. But those are very specific terms. Yahuda and Yisrael. That's the antithesis of Goyim. The antithesis of a church. And even then, it's based on the verb kadash, which is to renew, to reaffirm. Renewing is not new. Reaffirming is not new. Moreover, even in this text, where in Yirmiyah, Jeremiah 31, Yahweh speaks of renewing and reaffirming his covenant with Yahuda and Yisrael, he tells us that the only difference between this renewal and this restoration of his covenant and the original version of the covenant is that rather than offering us the Torah on a written scroll that we are encouraged to closely and carefully examine, he writes his Torah inside of us. The author of the Torah includes, gives, provides, scribes a perfect copy of his Torah teaching that is inside of us. Now you might say, well, first, before we say, uh, why would he do that then and not now, come to recognize that that if it's the Torah that is the only difference, the, the total uh, incorporation of the Torah into our very nature is the only difference between the covenant as it currently stands and the reaffirmation of the covenant. There can't be a new covenant. There can't be a new testament because the basis of that new testament is conceived entirely by Paul and he based it on the total and complete repudiation, the annulment of the Torah. And yet it's the Torah that is written perfectly and completely and entirely inside of our very nature by God himself <laughs> doesn't compute folks Returning to uh, the long edict uh, on the church by the Seventh-day Adventist, their uh, um, uh, next uh, statement uh, you know, talks about a new covenant. Now, what I wanted to address is that not only is there no new covenant and no reference to anything remotely uh, akin to a new covenant, and when the covenant is reaffirmed, it's done so on the basis of the Torah, which is the very thing that the Christian New Testament uh uh, destroys, at least in Paul's letters, not uh, Yosha's statements. The reason that the Torah can't be written inside of us right now is if, if that were done, then the free will would be uh, uh, negated. Not wholly negated, but mostly negated. Right now we have the opportunity to um, ignore, reject, oppose, corrupt, 
whatever we wish to, including embrace and understand and explore the Torah and its covenant. So now we have uh, the opportunity to make those choices. And most people have chosen to, to despise the Torah, and Christians despise it. And, uh, and that's their opportunity, free will. They have the opportunity to choose to reject it, to dislike it, to disavow it, to demean it, um, to say that it was replaced. But once Yahweh returns, everyone will have made their decision. Free will will have been uh, uh, made sacrosanct to the point that everyone will now have made their choice. You'll either be on one side or the other. And those who have chosen to embrace the Torah, who have found the Torah and its covenant to be uh, uh, enriching, um, empowering, uh, reassuring, uh, beneficial. Uh, the thing that we all want is what God's going to give us. We want a perfect copy of the Torah, of God's instruction, uh, written inside of us so that we know exactly what it is that uh, he is providing as guidance. And it's going to empower us to be, uh, to be so much more um, uh, effective, uh, enriched, uh, um, uh, enjoyable uh, as we explore the universe uh, and we participate in his covenant family throughout all eternity that's what we're what we choose and God's going to give us what we choose so that we can continue to now express free will but express free will within God's family as opposed to express free will as to whether or not to participate in God's family but the church most certainly isn't God's family uh, that is for fact, and there is no such thing as a new covenant. If you are a Christian, you've been misled on all of these things. Now, there are some that would say, wait a minute, uh, there's the uh, uh, reference in one of the three uh, uh, biographical uh, um, historical portraits that uh, ha- puts in uh, their Jesus' mouth the, uh, the idea that uh, the... Uh, blood and bread that are being consumed on Passover are part of a uh, of a new uh, covenant. Well, there's three accounts of uh, of what occurred there, and the uh, the two who were actually eyewitnesses don't uh, have the reference to new. And so, of the three accounts, two of them agree, one disagrees, and the one that disagrees is the one written by uh, as a result of hearsay. So you can do the math. It uh, then goes on to say the church is the body of Christ. (laughs) No, no. First of all, Yahusha's body, apart from Passover, which is what we've been talking about, is uh, uh, irrelevant. Um, Absolutely irrelevant. Uh, It's the soul that matters. And uh, so this notion of something being the body of, uh, even if they had the name right, of Yosha would be ridiculous. The body of Yosha no longer exists. The body of Yosha was destroyed the evening of Pesach in accordance with the Torah. That's the truth. That's why no one recognized uh, him on uh, Bukhutam, because his soul and the spirit uh, uh, created an entirely new physical manifestation as they saw fit. Now, Beyond all of that, um, the, there is no physical representation of, uh, of Yahweh other than Yahusha, and beyond Yahusha being a, a set-apart, diminished, physical manifestation of Yahweh, and him serving, therefore, as the Passover lamb in this way, Bodies are completely irrelevant. And part of the myth of, of Christianity, they want to have a bodily resurrection, so uh, uh, which is untrue and would be counterproductive. So they want to have them, they themselves represent this physical resurrection. Then it goes on to say a, uh, a community of faith of which Christ himself is the head. Uh, but the ocean never spoke of a church. Never. Completely never. It's a man-made institution. Religious clerics are the head. And they even go, the church is the bride for whom Christ died. Well, Yosha didn't die. His physical body died, but his soul, which is the, the, um, the proof of life, continued on. It's how he fulfilled matzah. 
the uh, Seventh Day Adventists even continue uh, at his return in triumph. Uh, you know, Yosha's not returning in triumph. I'm sorry. He's returning in great sorrow. When he returns, mankind will have been so devastatingly corrupt that if he doesn't return at this time, humanity will annihilate itself and the planet. He's returning at the last possible moment, and he is not the least bit pleased. He's going to spend the five days between Yom Kippur and when he returns, not that these idiots would know it, and uh, uh, Sukkah, which begins the celebration of a thousand years of camping out with God, of ridding the earth of idiots like this, ridding the earth of religion and politics and militarism. He's not pleased. At this point, he's actually had to intervene twice already. Once to uh, stop the all-Islamic uh, assault against Yisrael, not coming back physically, but having his spirit blow them away. And another time where he has to stop the, the second aspect of the war, this time uh, led by the United States. He's not the least bit entertained by this. And he's returning on to end the final phase of, uh, of the tribulation wars, um, even then. So it's in the midst of war that he's coming back. It's not triumphant. And the thing that he'll be celebrating is the reaffirmation of his covenant relationship uh, with his chosen people. Not with any church. He says that uh, upon his return and triumph he will present her to himself in a glorious church the faithful of all ages, the purpose of his blood, not having a spot or wrinkle, holy without blemish. Every church everywhere in the world will be evaporated instantly upon his return. All uh, Christians will be incinerated upon his return. He's not going to present himself in a glorious church. He is uh, going to reestablish his, uh, his house, his uh, temple, but he's going to build it himself right on top of the highest place of Mount Moriah, tearing down everything that is currently on the Temple Mount because it is religious rubbish. That's the truth. Now, this uh, uh, continues, and, and this would be, uh, to a large degree, um, uh, Christian, but also partly Seventh-day Adventist. That, uh, this is point 13, remnant and its mission. Now, from Yahweh's perspective, there is a remnant. It's a remnant of Yisrael, a remnant of Yahuda, because God's very explicit as the battles that will be waged first by Muslims and then by uh, the United States against uh, Israel and the consequence and the carnage of, of all of that. And he says that it's a remnant of his people, uh, not a church, not Gentiles, but of, of, uh, of Yahuda and uh, Yisrael that will be around at the end, who will be transformed, who will finally come to recognize who Yahweh is and what he has done for them, and, and uh, they will be reconciled in their relationship with him. It's a remnant of his people, of the chosen people. It has nothing to do with Gentiles or a church, universal or otherwise. But they write, the universal church, which would be uh, is the basis, by the way, of Catholic, is composed of all who truly believe in Christ. Now, mind you, there is no Christ. It just isn't. I mean, I don't care how much you, someone religiously wants to protest that there is a Christ. There is no Christ. You know, not only is the, uh, the title, uh, it's not a name, it's a title, uh, never written out in any Greek manuscript prior to Constantine, and not even written out in the initial Greek manuscripts, the uh, Sinaiticus Codex and the uh, uh, Vaticanus Codex. It's not even written out in either of those, which are complete codices. Never once on any page. Now, there is one place where we find a, uh, a um, reference to the basis of uh, the placeholder, that was actually used for uh, uh, the word that is tells us to look at to the Hebrew to understand Masaya. Now, mind you, these divine placeholders, which were scribed in 100% on every page and every single occurrence of all 
codexes of the Greek manuscripts forming the Christian New Testament. That on every page, 100% of the time, you see uh, a placeholder for Yahusha, a placeholder for Masaya, that they, the authors and the scribes were following the model of the Septuagint which was a translation of the Hebrew Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. And in the Septuagint, when they wrote the words, translated the words into Greek, they left the names in Hebrew. Because you can't transliterate names like Yahweh and Yahusha using the Greek alphabet. So they left the names, rather than mispronounce them, in Hebrew. And eventually, over time, as fewer people could read Hebrew. In this, the later versions of the Septuagint, they used uh, Greek placeholders, capital letters with a line over them, to represent where the Hebrew names uh, were written. That's the basis of these divine placeholders. They were used then again in the uh, uh, so-called Christian uh, New Testament, exclusively, without variation. And the, the three places where we have evidence of the basis of the placeholder for Masaya. We find that it is written using Christus, not using Christos. Very different words. One speaks of the application of drugs, Christos, the basis of Christ, and the other speaks of a useful servant, a protective implement, which is then akin to Masaya, which is the work of Yah. And both Roman Historical portraits speak of Christi Christuanios and Christus, not Christos. Welcome back to Shattering Mists. Yes, this uh, point 13, Remnant in its Mission, uh, uh, is full of uh, additional lies. It reveals the universal church, which there is no such thing. Uh, God does not have a church. It's composed of all those who truly believe. Now, I will give you that, that uh, the religious institution is comprised entirely of believers, because they're, uh, uh, if they were knowers and understanders, they wouldn't be Christians. It is impossible, ladies and gentlemen, to be an informed and rational Christian. It's just like it's impossible to be informed in rational Muslim. If you are well informed, you know what God actually said, and you compare it to what your religion says, and you are reasonable about the application of that information. You make good judgments based upon that information. If you're the least bit discerning regarding that information, you, uh, you will have to reject the belief system. It's impossible to be an informed and rational Christian. I'm just as a statement of fact. Uh, going on to say that uh, truly believe in Christ, of course, we have uh, pummeled that. There is no such thing as Christ. Uh, in fact, even the, the actual Greek translation of the, uh, of the title was Christus, not Christos, and entirely different words. Christus is a useful implement. Uh, Christos means uh, drugs have been applied. And then it says, but in the last days, a time of widespread apostasy. Well, actually, there's... Not a lot more apostasy in the uh, the last days than prior to them. Uh, the difference is that is that man's religious and political inclinations become uh, more capable of killing, and so it's it's that uh, Muslims, uh, when Israel is really vulnerable and thinned at the waist, as we're told, become extraordinarily aggressive, and uh, and now they're empowered with American weapons, and they really are deadly. Um, and that with atomic weapons, uh, the United States is in a military force, the ability to project it. The United States is really deadly. Uh, and with mass communications, the ability to, uh, to indoctrinate uh, people with the same apostasy is a lot more effective. And then with control over electronic money and the destruction of currencies and economies so that people are prone to sign on to new economic systems, uh, as will be the case uh, through this uh, transition through anarchy, uh, it's just that the, the same kinds of, uh, of, of Corrupt and uh, and miserable uh, behavior is just in today's world is capable of being considerably more harmful, more destructive. 
Now, then it says a remnant has been called out to keep the commandments of God in faith in Jesus. No, a remnant isn't called out. A remnant is spared, and a remnant will ultimately choose to leave religion and politics, and the remnant happens to be, though, entirely Yahudim and Yisrael. Uh, Yisrael uh, ites the uh, those who are racially um, uh, descendants of Jacob, and what they are going to do is they're not going to express faith in anyone, most certainly not in Jesus. They're going to recognize Yahweh. And in fact, Yahweh says they're going to look upon me who they have pierced. And they're going to recognize who I am. They're going to know who I am. They're going to understand who I am. Yahweh says this. It's Yahweh who is returning. Not uh, some fictional Jesus. God actually doesn't have commandments. That is a myth too. Uh, and by the way, if, if Christians were to actually keep uh, the things that they mistake as commandments, they'd no longer be Christians. The first three totally and completely denounce Christianity. Uh, just destroy it. The first three. God, God is introducing himself, and they're statements. They're not commandments. They are they are the bar uh, and the barim, which means words. But three statements, the first three statements, which comprise the first of the two tablets, that the first three introduces Yahweh is the one and only God. It introduces Yahweh as the Savior. It says that anybody that uh, tries to exist with a God other than Yahweh will cease to be. And so, absolutely destructive of, uh, of Christianity and of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, destructive of calling God, God, and, um, uh, and of referring to him as the Lord. He has a name. It's Yahweh. If you don't know his name, you don't know him. He introduces himself by name, and he demonstrates that he is our Savior personally. And even explains how he goes about saving us, which is through his mikra. The second statement is about not being religious. It says, you know, I don't want you in any way, shape, or form to be religious. I don't want you bowing down. I don't want you uh, making religious uh, icons or statues. Or uh, in no way, shape, or form should you uh, be in a worshiping environment, particularly worshiping a man. 